First Thessalonians chapter two. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext of greed. God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. While we proclaim to you the gospel of God, you are witnesses and God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you, believers. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The word of the Lord. All right, let me pray for us. Father, what a privilege to be here. Uh, What a privilege. And as we start 2015 and all the hope and optimism that comes with the new year, what what a just joy to be able to open up your word and have you reveal yourself to us. So God, I pray just that you would prepare our hearts, that you'd prepare our ears, and that you alone would get the glory here this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. All right, so like Aaron said, my name is Daniel, and yes, this is my first sermon I am preaching, so take it easy on me. Um, yeah, I am one of the pastors here at The Crossing, and it's, it's just a joy to, to be here and share some of these things from this passage, which is uh, very close to my heart. Uh, but as we begin here this morning, I, I want you to take a trip with me back to the year 2008. So just seven years ago, and that was the year that I actually became a Christian. And growing up in Dallas, I went to a Catholic church, I went to a Methodist church a little bit, and as I came here to CSU, I never really understood how a first century Jewish man who died on the cross was very relevant to my daily life. But that was until God orchestrated certain people and certain events in my life. So in the spring of 2008, I hit what I call my low of college, and that was because of my girlfriend at the time, she broke up with me. Now, this gal, she was my everything, and when she broke up with me, I was devastated, and my life was in shambles. And so I came to her and I said, can we at least still be friends with the hopes of getting back together with her? And she said, yeah, sure but you have to come to church with me. So I was like, whoa, church, I haven't been to church in a long time. But yeah, sure. So I found myself in a church the next Sunday, and it was very interesting because I ran into one of my teammates from the hockey team at CSU there. His name was Doug, and he and I had played for the CSU club team for a couple years. And uh, But Doug, his life was a little bit different. He stopped hanging out with us teammates a little bit. He, uh, he stopped partying and drinking with us. And so Doug, he, he looks at me, and he's just kind of like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, and so he asked me, what, what are you doing here? And I said, um, I'm here with a girl. And he said, of course you are. <laughs> and... Uh, But what he said to me next, uh, it it stuck with me, and he said, I'm really glad you're here. And the thing was is that he was authentic and he meant it. And so after he asked me to sit with him, I I said, no, I'm going to go sit with my girlfriend. So we sat down and we learned about this first century Jewish man who died on a cross. But over the next few days and weeks and even months, Doug started being more intentional in my life. And he started coming over to my house more and spending time with me. And he actually invited me to a Bible study, and I was pretty reluctant at first because I didn't understand the importance of studying the Bible. But after his persistence, I said, yeah, sure, I'll come with you, Doug. 
And so as I'm walking up to this Bible study, um, it's in it's in a house in my neighborhood. I just remember thinking, like, what am I doing? <laughs> and so just to kind of paint a picture for you guys, when I was in college, um, I smoked pot every day. I went to the bars very often, and I chased girls. That was my life. And so walking into this Bible study, I had no idea what to ex- expect. So I sit down, and the guy next to me, his name was Brian, and he loved hockey. And by God's grace, it was an instant connection. But as as the night progressed, I observed something that was different with these guys. They did study the Bible. They did have a reverence for Jesus. But they also had a really great time together. They made jokes, and they laughed hard. And we just had a good time. And this was so different from what I was used to because my teammates and my friends at the time, all they wanted to do was get drunk and punch each other in the face. And so these guys, they had a genuine care for each other, but they also took their sins seriously and they wanted to help each other throughout their daily lives. And so I kept coming back because the genuine care that they had for each other, they also had for me. And as the spring passed and the summer came in full swing, these, got, these guys got closer into my life. And I let them in, and I let them know what I was living my life for, namely for chasing after the next girl or getting the next goal on the ice. But these guys lived their lives with me. And they showed me the truth of God's word and how it's not based on my performance, but it's based on the performance of his son, Jesus and also that I had a Father in Heaven who loved me deeply. And it's because of these guys that I gave my life to Jesus, that I put my faith in what He had done for me. And so, guys, as we open up God's Word today, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we get to peer into Paul's method of ministry. So for those of you that have been joining us regularly on Sundays, we've been going through the book of Acts. And Paul actually is on his secondary missionary journey when he writes this book to the Thessalonian church that he planted just 12 months before. So a little bit of the background about Thessalonica. Um, This this letter was actually written in around AD 50, so it's about 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul is actually writing this letter. It's it's mentioned in chapter 1 that it's from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. But it's safe to assume that Paul is the one actually writing the letter. But Silas and Timothy are close by, um, giving input to Paul as he's writing. So about the actual city, Thessalonica, it's a city of about 100,000 people, which was pretty big for the day. And... It actually is on a natural land harbor. So the city is right off the sea, but it's surrounded by land on all sides. And that was a very interesting for the day because people who traveled by boat, they were able to come to this harbor, park their boats and keep it safe there, and they'd go into the city. But also, Thessalonica was right on what's called the Ignatian Way, and it was a prominent trade and travel route to the day. Uh, You might think of an interstate, because it connected Rome to the rest of the East. And I think that's significant because there are lots of people coming to this city. And with that, lots of teachers and philosophers of the day would come to the city. And so what Paul did in Acts chapter 17, coming to Thessalonica and reasoning in the synagogue, as was his custom, for three Sabbath days, it wasn't anything new for the people of Thessalonica. But what was different was how Paul lived his life among them. And that's what we're going to peer into here today. And so I've titled today's message, An Authentic Appeal. And we're going to see this morning that Paul didn't just share Jesus with the Thessalonians, but he brought authenticity to his appeal as he shared his life with them. So, as we're going to dig into verse 1 here, I'm just going to read it for us. If you have your Bible, please keep it handy because we're going to be jumping around here in this passage. 
So verse 1, he says, For you, you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. So right off the bat, he, you see this little word there, for. And Paul uses this word often in his writings. He uses this for reasoning or argumentation, argumentation purposes. Uh, you could even switch out the word because whenever you see the word for in Paul's writings. And what he's saying here is that their coming to the Thessalonians was not in vain because the gospel came to them and had its full effect in their lives. Now let me just pause here for a second and explain what I mean by the gospel. We often talk about it here a lot at the crossing, um, and you might have an idea what the gospel is, but let me just explain what it is. The gospel is good news. It's, it's a message that God, being set apart and different from his created humanity, um, God didn't just leave us in ourselves. And when man, whom he created, rebelled against God and said, you know what, God? I don't need you. I'm going to figure it out on my own. You know what? I'm going to actually worship the things that you created and gave me. I'm going to worship those things instead of you and just figure out this life on my own. But the good news and the sweetness of the gospel is that God didn't end there and leave us on our own, but he actually showed us great mercy and didn't give us what we deserve, namely, which was punishment and his wrath and eternal separation. And in his great love, he sent his son Jesus. He sent us Jesus to live among us, to know what it was like to be a human. He sent Jesus to live a perfect And what I mean by perfect, a life without sin. And Jesus died a death on a cross, a shameful death, a punishing death, a death that we deserved. And after he resurrected, after he rose from the dead, a man rose from the dead, it demands a response from all of us. And so for those who respond with faith and trust in Jesus, we're given eternal life. We're given fullness of joy. But he also calls us into something. He calls us into a life that is not our own, but is actually his. And Jesus' perfect life is credited to us, and the death that we deserve is credited to Jesus' death. He becomes our substitute. And we're no longer enemies, but we become part of God's family. And he welcomes us in with open arms. So, as we jump back in here, guys, this is Paul's appeal to them. This is what he came and said to them. But in verse 2, Paul talks about the situation in Acts chapter 16 where he was shamefully treated and suffered. So if you remember in Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in Philippi, and they have a slave girl who is following them around and actually kind of bothering them. And Paul turns and rebukes her, and she actually comes to faith in Jesus. Now, her owners didn't really appreciate this, and they proceeded to grab Paul and Silas, drag them before the city authorities, and they proceeded to rip their clothes, beat them, and throw them into prison. Pretty shameful, and they're suffering for the cause of Christ here. Now, it is shameful because Paul and Silas are, in fact, Roman citizens, and they are due the the just process of the law, but that wasn't given to them here, and they continued to suffer for Jesus. Now, let me just pause here and talk a little bit about suffering. Many of us have, in fact, suffered in various ways in our lives. Um, Maybe it's through a relationship that we've had, or maybe it's through a family member that's caused us pain, perhaps a divorce that we've been through or our family has been through. Maybe it's more physical related to sickness or cancer or even just an old body that's failing as you get older. Perhaps it was even a a loved one who died before you expected. In our culture, we'll do anything possible to avoid suffering. And it makes sense because suffering is, in fact, painful. But the good news is, is that suffering refines us and it reminds us that this world is not our home. It's not our home. It wasn't the original design and it's not where we're headed. But so often we just want relief from suffering. So often we just want to be released. 
when in fact God is actually using it to refine us. He's using it to refine us and make us more like his son Jesus, who can sympathize with us because he suffered much for us. And God also wants to use our suffering and our circumstances to accomplish his purposes. And that's actually what Paul is saying here, is that his suffering helps his appeal. As he's being mistreated, he doesn't use his suffering as an excuse to stop the mission, but it actually compels him to more boldness in declaring the gospel. And with this boldness, the word of God prevailed on the Thessalonians. They came to faith in Jesus, and it was awesome. And as they came to faith, what wasn't awesome is the same opponents that chased Paul and Silas out of Thessalonica then turned and started persecuting the new converts. They slandered him. And as you can see in verse 3, you can almost hear what they're saying. It's as if they're saying, you cannot believe his message. It's untrue. It's full of error. His motives are impure. He's trying to deceive you. Can't you see that? But in the verses that follow, Paul begins to break down why his appeal is in fact authentic. And we see this done predominantly in two ways. His appeal is authentic as he has a pure heart before God and as he shares his life with the Thessalonians. So first, let's take a look how Paul has a pure heart before God. Look with me at chapter or at verse 4 of chapter 2. It says, "But just as we've been approved by God, to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. So for those of you that don't know, the heart in scripture is really seen as in, in the inner being of man, where all the thoughts, motives, intentions, and emotions flow out of. Proverbs 4.23, one of my favorite verses, says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And it has this picture of a wellspring or headwaters, and everything, streams and rivers, flow down from it. And that's our heart. Jesus illustrated this in Luke 6.45 when he said, Out of abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. One of the greatest verses on God's view of the heart is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And after King Saul has been rejected as king over Israel, God sends Samuel to go find a new king, the Lord's anointed. Now, some of you probably know the story. It ends up being King David. And as Samuel goes to David's father, David actually isn't there. And he's looking at all his brothers. But right before he gets there, God gives Samuel instruction in 1 Samuel 16, 7. And he says, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So look here in the passage how Paul illustrates his heart is right before God. In verse 4, he says he's approved. His aim is to please God. Paul's the chosen instrument to bring the gospel to the Gentiles to those who aren't predominantly God's people. But God has entrusted him with the message, and he sent him. He's been approved by God. In verse 5, he mentions that uh, there was no pretext for greed. God is a witness that there's no underlying motive here for, for him to get rich. In verse, 10, in verse 10, he says, as the Thessalonians are witnesses, God is also, as he sees their conduct among them is pure. So Paul's appeal to his heart before God is a significant argument here because God can see something that the Thessalonians cannot, which is namely his pure heart before him. God knows their hearts. They're not out for money. Their conduct was pure, and they're aiming to honor and please God, not to earn their salvation, but because being secure in their own, they want other people to experience the same salvation that they have. But as we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, he brought the gospel message to the Thessalonians. And he didn't just say, all right, looks like my work's done here. Let's move it on out. Berea, here we come. But no, he stayed among them. 
and he allowed them, the Thessalonians, to see the authenticity of his message as he lived and shared his life. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is Paul's strongest argument to his opponents. Look how this is illustrated in verse 1. He said, You yourselves know brothers. Verse 5, For we never came with words of flattery, as you know. Verse 9, For you remember, brothers, our labor and our toil among you. Verse 10, You are witnesses. Verse 11, For you know. Guys, what we see here is in fact a genuine life lived among the, the Thessalonian people. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they were full of truth. Since They were sincere. They were pure in their motives. He didn't puff them up with words that had hidden intentions. He didn't look to come here and plant a church to get rich. In fact, he was an example among them in working with his hands, something that he addresses in both of the letters that we have to the Thessalonians. These people, some of them, didn't want to work for a living, and they would expect handouts for the richer Christians. But Paul didn't demand money from them. He was an example to them as he worked. He also mentions in verse 6 that they could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul had the right to seek for money from the churches that he ministers to. This has its origin in the Old Testament when we saw the Levites were set apart for God's purposes, and they earned their living from tithes that were given to the temple. This same model continued as the pattern in the New Testament as Paul was on these missionary journeys and he planted these churches. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So he had all the right to ask them for money, to seek money from them. But he didn't because he believes that if he would have asked for money here, it would have been counterproductive and brought into question his authenticity. Let me attempt to illustrate this. Um, I'd love to see a show of hands. Who here has seen counterfeit money? Who here has held counterfeit money? No. No. Counterfeit U.S. currency. Some of you have, but not a lot of you have, because there's, quite frankly, just not a lot in circulation. It's estimated that 0.01% of counterfeit bills are actually in circulation in the United States. And those who are trained to recognize counterfeit bills, they don't spend all their time looking at the fakes, but they spend their time knowing and understanding what the real bills look like and feel like. It's pretty easy to recognize U.S. currency because as you touch it, the texture is very distinctive and the thinness of the paper is very hard to duplicate. But as you look at it, you can also see in the fine printing details and there's also security features such as the watermark or maybe the colored threads on the paper. So when experts are examining these bills and looking for these details, they know right away what's real and what's counterfeit because they've seen the authentic bill so often. And that's what Paul's saying here, is that he and his co-laborers were real, authentic, accurate, and trustworthy. And the Thessalonians know this because of a shared life among them and how they formed a deep relationship with them. He uses two great metaphors in this passage, namely a nursing mother in verse 7 and a father with his children in verse 12. So a mother who nurses not only feeds and nourishes this child, but she holds it close and keeps it warm and forms a unique and special bond with this little baby in her arms. When Michelle and I were pregnant and we had our first child, Solomon, it was pretty funny, the contrast between her and I. For those of you that were at our gender reveal party, you might know what I'm saying, but I was so pumped to have our first kid. I was just jumping for joy. I was ecstatic. I was literally bouncing off the walls. Michelle, on the other hand, she was a little bit nervous. She was a little bit anxious to uh, be responsible for this little human, for this life form. And the reality that once this baby's outside of her womb, she's directly responsible for feeding it and nourishing it. 
Not only that, but Michelle didn't really like babies because, you know, they're small, they're fragile, I don't know how to hold the neck, like what do I do here? Um, but that was until little Solomon was born and placed into her arms. And immediately that unique and special bond was formed between her and her son. And that has continued today as Solomon's gotten bigger and as we've had our second child, Jude. And that unique bond, I've never seen it. I've never seen the same bond between two humans. It's pretty special. The father, on the other hand, he plays a pretty unique role in the life of the child as well. As Solomon is getting older, he's about a year and a half, he's starting to flex his self-will a little bit with Michelle and I. You guys might know what what I'm talking about here. Um, And I'll explain to him, no, Solomon, you can't rub your food and your hair at the dinner table. Or no, Solomon, you can't run around the house naked while we're changing your diaper. Or no, Solomon, you can't open up the door while someone is using the bathroom. Um, But in all seriousness, I love both my sons very deeply. But at times, I need to be firm and consistent with Solomon as I speak instruction into his life. And that's what Paul did here. He spoke truth into their lives. Namely, how what they were living for wasn't going to satisfy them. And how Jesus was the only one that was going to satisfy them. But he backed it up with the love just as a father should do. He was the Thessalonians' biggest advocate, and they knew that. That's what Paul's appealing to here. But really, the culmination of this passage is in verse 8. I'm going to read it. He says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. So... (laughs) Being affectionately desirous of you. That's not typically language that we use in our day-to-day life here in America. Um, It's actually the only time the Greek word is used here in the New Testament. But it has this sense of longing, and it has a strong desire that is moved by emotions. I think of the desire that a young groom has who's waited his whole life to be with his bride on their wedding night. I also think of Solomon, who after a long day of his dad out being gone, wants nothing more to be reunited with me. And as I walk in the door, greet Michelle, give her a kiss, I then lift up my little man, throw him high to the sky, and we're reunited at last. So guys, the Thessalonians were like children to Paul. Young children who needed milk for spiritual nourishment, but they had also become very dear to him as he shared his soul with them. So, let me ask you, how are you doing with being an authentic life sharer with those around us who don't know Jesus? I'm sure you can think of family and friends who you want nothing more but for them to give their lives to Jesus. Maybe you've brought them to one of our Sunday gatherings, which is awesome. Maybe you've even brought them here today, which is even better. Maybe your New Year's resolution is to introduce them to Christian community, which would be a pretty good one, in my opinion. I'm not sure who you're thinking of, but I am sure of this, that God wants to use us in the lives of those people. God wants to use us, the Crossing Church, in the lives of people who don't know Jesus. And as we share our lives with them, he also wants us to share the truth with who Jesus is. So I've got just a few ways for you here this morning how we can share authentic lives with those who don't know Jesus. And the first way is through the avenue of sharing meals together. So sharing meals in Jesus' day was actually one of the most intimate activities that you could do together. But we've kind of lost that in our culture when food becomes a hindrance just to get more things done in our busy schedules. But it doesn't have to be that way, guys. And if you think about it like this, you've got three meals a day, seven seven days a week. That means 21 opportunities each week 
that you can share with someone who doesn't know Jesus. Occasionally, Michelle and I will sit down as the week begins and we'll, we'll chart out these 21 meals and say, okay, what meals do we want to eat together as a family? What meals do we want to eat together with our Christian community? And what meals do we want to share with those who don't know Jesus? Now, if that's too much for you, let me just encourage you, try one. One meal a week. It could be lunch with a coworker or a student that you just want to get to know better. Perhaps it's dinner with a neighbor who your kids are playing with in the neighborhood, but you don't know them super well. Or maybe it's somebody who's just come into your Christian community and you want to get to know them better. It's so easy to go grab breakfast. There's so many great places to eat here in Fort Collins. So I encourage you to give it a shot. The second way that we can live authentic lives with those who don't know Jesus is through the avenue of our hobbies. So us Christians, I think we're notorious for just being in our Christian bubbles and what I'll call our Christian ghettos. Uh, you know what I'm talking about with the Christian softball league or the Christian book club or the Christian running club or the Christian underwater basket weaving association. <laughs> The big, this is a big reason why we don't have programs here at The Crossing, is because we want you guys to go out and do your hobbies, do your passions with those that don't know Jesus, but the great city of Fort Collins can organize it for us. As some of you know, I love to play hockey. It's one of my favorite hobbies. I just love to go out on the pond or on the ice rink because it's a great avenue to meet new people. And as I meet some of these people, I get to know them, I ask them questions, and maybe the Lord puts it on my heart right then and there to share the truth about who Jesus is with them. But oftentimes, that's not the case. Oftentimes, I'll invite them into my life. I'll introduce them to my wife or my Christian community. And so, let me ask you guys, what do you guys like to do? What are your hobbies? What are you passionate about? And how can you do that with your friends that don't know Jesus. The third way to share authentic lives is by the art of listening to people. You've heard it say that listening could be an act of love. And I firmly believe that it is. The late theologian and evangelist Francis Schaeffer said that if he had just one hour with people, he would spend the first 55 minutes listening to them and the last five minutes speaking to him. And I think he's on to something here, because as we share our lives with people and we listen to them well, I believe we love them well. So one of the best ways that you can listen to people is through asking them questions. Now question asking, I believe, is a skill that can be developed. Uh, you can ask my wife or my parents. I love to ask questions, and I just tend to ask a lot of them. Um, but I had to really work at it to, to, ask the good, to ask good ones. So you can think of question asking as three different layers, and the first layer is pretty surface level. These could be questions such as, hey, how's it going, or how are you? Maybe, what is your name? That tends to be a pretty good question to ask. Um, or it could be something along the lines of, what do you do for a living? I think that's pretty surface level in our culture. But the second layer is, as you get a little bit deeper into their lives, you're asking them more personal questions, such as, where are you from, or how long have you been in Fort Collins, um, or what is your family like? People love to talk about themselves, and if you give them an opportunity, they most likely will. The third layer of questions, if you can get to them, I believe you start to hear and see what's going on in their hearts that's causing them to not believe in Jesus. And these questions could be something along the lines of, so how did you feel about that? Could be based on a, a circumstance in their lives or, or a current event. Or it could be, what, what do you really long for in life? Um, that, that tends to be a pretty good one that I've asked. Um, or it could be something as simple as, what are your spiritual beliefs and why do you believe in them? Guys, people are more open to talking about their spiritual beliefs than we might believe. And it might just give us an opportunity to share what we believe and why we believe. So questions 
They're just a tool. But they can be a tool to listen well. They can also be an effective tool as you share your lives, as you share your hobbies, and as you share meals with people. So I want to leave you guys this morning with a story of a dear friend. As I mentioned earlier, I love to play hockey because it's a great way to meet people. Well, four years ago, I met a guy on the hockey rink. His name was Mike. And Mike was brand new to the game of ice hockey. And so I'd give him tips here and there. And that's really how our friendship started. So we would continue to play over the, the, the weeks. And one day in the locker room, I started asking Mike some questions. And he told me that he's from Oklahoma, and he's a pharmacist, and also that uh, he had a daughter. And so that, that day, I got Mike's number, and, and we started communicating over text messages. And uh, before our game the next week, I, I sent him a text. And I said, hey, man, would you want to go to lunch? And he said, yeah, that sounds great. I said, awesome. I'm going to invite my friend Aaron, who's going to play with us today. So we go out, we play, I introduce him to Aaron, and then we go to lunch afterwards, and we get our sandwiches, and we sit down, and we're just laughing about how we just, yeah, f fell on the ice and, and didn't do a very good job out there. But Mike turns to us and he says, so what do you guys do for a living? And um, Aaron proceeded to say, well, I'm a pastor, and I told Mike that I worked for the Navigators, which is a an organization, and basically, I just like to hang out with college kids all day and talk to them about Jesus. And Mike was kind of taken aback by that response from us. He wasn't really expecting it, um, but he quickly said, oh, that's cool. Uh, I grew up going to church, and, and I'm a believer. Um, but we didn't go into too much detail that day. We, we just continued to enjoy our conversation and talk about uh, our hockey game. But as the weeks and as the months went on, Mike started sharing his life with me, and I started sharing my life with him. He loved to play poker, and I loved to take people's money, so we'd play poker games. <laughs> he loved to play video games, which I don't love to do, but we'd do that together. I would inconvenience myself to be with him. And as we did these things, I really felt the Holy Spirit urging inside of me to talk to Mike about spiritual things to ask him more questions about his beliefs. And so I did, and uh, so I, I just asked him, hey, so you grew up in a church, what do you think about Jesus these days? And he responded with, yeah, I'm a believer, but I just don't trust the Bible. I, I just don't think it's very reliable, I don't think you can stake your life on it, and uh, I just don't get it. So that kind of took me aback, because I had never met a Christian who didn't trust the Bible. And Mike actually had some really hard questions about the reliability of the Bible, questions that I didn't know how to answer, but that didn't hinder me from seeking out answers. And it definitely didn't hinder me from sharing my life with him. So as we continued to build the relationship, I introduced him to Michelle, brought him into my home, and I got questions, and I got answers to his questions. But as we began to talk about it more, I saw that these questions that he had were just a mask to something going on deeper in Mike's heart. So I asked him a little bit more about his daughter, and he said that she came from a previous marriage that went sour and actually ended in a pretty nasty divorce. And Mike felt a ton of guilt and shame from that divorce. And he didn't believe that Jesus would love him or forgive him for some of the mistakes that he had made. So I remember sitting there and talking with Mike and just saying, buddy, when we put our faith in Jesus, there's, there's no condemnation. There's no fear of guilt or punishment. But Jesus actually put the, took the punishment upon himself on our behalf. Now let me, let me just pause here and say that it took me two years to get to this point, from meeting Mike on the hockey rink to seeing how Jesus was relevant in his life. And over the course of the next year, we continued to have more relevant conversations about Jesus. He started introducing me to some of his friends that didn't know Jesus, and he started to observe my marriage and other marriages in our church, and he really saw that he had a longing to be married. But when I met Mike, 
He would have called himself a Christian, but only recently would he say that he put his faith in Jesus and had a personal encounter with him. And after the gospel started to take root, he started to read his Bible ferociously. He wanted to be the spiritual leader to his daughter. And Mike plugged into a life group here at the crossing. He also met a girl who became his wife this past fall. And him and his family went to go plant Choice City Church because he wanted to make his life count for Jesus. So guys, we have people all around us who don't know Jesus, but they need us. God wants to use us in their lives. I don't consider myself an evangelist, but it's my desire for us, the Crossing Church, in 2015 and beyond to do the work of an evangelist. And as we trust God, share authentic lives with people, and share the truth of the gospel message, I really believe that God will use us to bring more people, just like Mike, to faith in Jesus. Let me pray for us.